Okay, my name is Hala Alawi, and on behalf of Atmosphere Press, I am so pleased to welcome everybody to today's live author reading. Today we'll be hearing from M. A. Arana, reading from Wing Stroke, released May 20th. Sophia Bacadano, reading from This Is My Worst Nightmare, Please Be Nice to Me, released on July 16th. And Michael Tavella, reading from Adriel Peregrine, released August 6th. All three authors' books can be purchased both from online retailers and from select bookstores. And of course, the books can be ordered on Atmosphere Press's website. That's at atmosphereprescom forward slash books. And I'll also put some links in the chat for everybody to check out. At the end of today's event, we are also going to have time for audience questions. So during the readings, if you have a question for one or more of our authors, go ahead and type those in the chat and I'll make sure they get asked. And then during the actual event, please stay muted so we can keep extraneous sound at a minimum, but definitely feel free to also use the chat for any praise and comments in addition to questions. And one last note is that we at Atmosphere Press appreciate your support today and always. If you have a manuscript of your own, we would love to read it. So submit your work today to books at atmosphereprest.com. Again, thank you so much for tuning in and supporting Maria, Sophia, and Michael today. We're going to start off with our first reader, who is M.A. Arana. Maria is a writer, poet, and editor from the Los Angeles area. She's published many poems and short stories in various publications. Formerly a teacher who encouraged a love of reading and writing, she now channels that passion to create magical stories for a wider audience. She lives with her family, four dogs, and one cat who thinks she's a queen herself. You can find her on X, formerly Twitter, at, at M underscore A underscore Arana and www.booksbymaarana.com or at Arana Editing Services, where she also blogs. In Wingstroke, which we'll be hearing from today, we immerse ourselves in a gripping tale of revenge and change. It's more than a story of reclaiming a kingdom. It's a desperate battle for recognition in a world that has yet to acknowledge its character's existence. And we'll hear more of the story now from Maria Herson. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I see uh, some familiar names on the chat. So thank you for joining, Cindy, Evie. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say congratulations to the two authors following me for their books that came out. I wish you much luck with them. Um, I'm also grateful for everyone that has been following me through this journey. I'm Emma Arana, author of the Wing series. Today I'm gonna to be focusing on Wing Stroke, which is my recent book that came out in May. I'm gonna be reading from chapter five. In order to do that, I'm just gonna ground you a little bit into what the story is about. Our main character, Maven Sevilla, is an Avon prince who was exiled from his home world to Earth. On Earth, he met Tori and he married her and had twin sons. And a few years later, he got called back to his home world because of the Gargan threat, as well as his mother's illness, which she is the queen. Of course, if he's a prince, right? But unbeknownst to him, the Gargans have a prophecy, and that is that when a prince has twin sons, one of the twin sons is able to harbor Gargan blood and magic and help them destroy the Avens. So in book two, we're going to delve deeper into that prophecy. And I'm going to read chapter five, which is actually, I chose this chapter because it's begins that climax towards that goal that the Gargans have and what Maven has to do to try to stop them. Okay. In order to do this, I've got to put my readers on. So here we go. Chapter five. On his way to meet his mother, Maven caught sight of his sons exiting her study. Their faces were forlorn, just as the day they rescued a bird they tended that died after days of caring for it. Maven rushed toward them and kneeled in front of them. What is it? He took each of their trembling hands. 
Queen Kalani asked us to come and then she felt tired, Xander replied. She doesn't want company right now, Zio added. Maybe lowered his eyes and wondered whether the side effects of the poison Ibis gave her were part of a bigger curse. It's been years since they drained the poison, but the queen continued to weaken, even aging differently than other Avens. He'd have to counsel Oda, though Oda had been avoiding him lately. Removing his hands, Mabin rose and looked at the closed doors to the study where two guards stood still, their armor gleaming, accentuating their broad shoulders. Surely his mother had time to speak with him about her condition or about Tori's request to let the twins spend more time on earth. But he didn't want to press it, especially since he knew she would rather have them prepare for their coming wings. Turning back to his sons, he asked, well, what news did the queen bestow? Not much, she, Zio shrugged. Save the world and stuff. Maven placed his arms at Kimbo. And I suppose you accepted such a fate. Well, she struck a hard bargain, Zio said, moving his arms opposite each other with a tilt to his head. Xander burst out laughing. And Zio joined him. The two almost bumped heads. Maven could only smile. Prince Maven, a voice boomed down the hallway. The Sevillas turned and spotted Koba's approach. His sword and shield clapped against each other as he ran, and his finely sculpted muscles rippled with each step, but the look on his face was that of dread. My lord, Koba bowed and touched his forehead. You must come to the courtyard. Maven smiled faded as he neared Galino's second in command. What is it, my friend? Take a deep, taking a deep breath, Koba's eyebrows knit together. King Wekar has broken through our barriers. His spirit wants to address you. Protect the queen. Maven sprouted his large white wings, almost knocking down his sons. He bowed to the two boys and said, don't leave the study. I'll let your mother know. I already did, father, Xander said, his voice cracking. He took Zio's hand. We'll stay with the queen. And Zio had closed his eyes for a second. And when he opened them, he stated, I don't like him coming here. Neither do I, son, but I must depart. Fine, Zio added. I called Romeo to our side. Maven nodded to them, and Koba returned the gesture as he relayed the message to the guards. And he flew down the corridor. Turning a sharp left, he signaled for the doors to open to the courtyard. Troops lined up for battle, their swords drawn some with spears at their sides or shields in hand. Their gold and silver helmets and armor plates beamed with the Avon symbol, wings with a sword in between. Half of the army surrounded the image of King Wakar for the first defense. The rest settled behind Galino and Maven landed beside him. The Garden King's laughter thundered in the open space. Only his large head took up the center of the courtyard his twisted horns and sharp teeth terrified the Avens looking in from the terraces or behind trees. So the prodigal son remained under the queen's command. The whispers were silenced and his hot essence singed Maben's skin. Speak, Maben's fists tightened and his knuckles turned white. Why do you intrude on Ava without a cordial invitation? I don't need an invitation. The princess eyebrows shot up. And I will never adhere to your peace talks unless you give me what is rightfully mine. What's he talking about? Tori had made her mate pass the guards to Maven's side. Woman, you must step back. Galino pressed a shield in front of her. Tori met the Avon leader's piercing green eyes and fine nose. At first, she wanted to push ahead, but then she noticed her husband's concerned stare and agitated jaw. Maven motioned for her to stay behind. Once she stepped back a little, Maven continued to address the king. By breaking the code to speak on neutral ground, you dance on waging war. King Wakar bellowed. He narrowed his fuming eyes and said, if within three hours I do not have what I want, the earth will experience the wrath it so much deserves. As the image faded, Maven reached for the creature's horns, but only caught the mist. Some Avens burst into unison in their displeasure, and some cried for peace. Others held their children in a tight embrace. This is absurd, Galino sent two sets of his guards to recheck the perimeter, 
and another set to scout a butt for any foul play from the Gargans. Then he addressed the prince, holding the pommel of his sword. Queen Kalani would have to meet this challenge. Galino, please, are you going to allow this violation to play out? He closed the distance between them, head high. We have to look into what King Wakar means by dooming the world. So while we research our prey, they proceed to prepare for their plans. He means to take my babies, Galino, Tori intervened. Your acting king only wishes to be informed before making hasty decisions. You dare, Galino raised an eyebrow. He had flawless skin and raven hair, which moved freely and securely, but his eyes alone could intimidate. This is just the beginning, don't you see? Tori approached the Avian leader. They must have something to risk coming here. She is right. Those gathered stopped and turned toward the collective direct voice. The Avis hidden behind trees stepped out of their shadow. Oda hovered above them, alighting on the mound. His cloak waved like a flag and the beard he had grown longer joined it. The Gargans hold in their possession an ancient text full of dark magic. The same one Ibis used to conjure up the spells that kept her alive. And the same book keeps the queen in her stupor. Camille appeared above the crowd in her dark green dress with waving sleeves. And she flew down after Oda. Her long black hair bounced off her shoulders. She was beautiful and determined. We must get it back before the Gargans unleash havoc on Earth. We might be too late for that, dear, Galino said. He approached his mate and kissed her hand. They mean to slay us while we protect the world from whatever they unleash. This talk is getting us nowhere, Tori said in frustration. What are we going to do to stop them? If they have the book already, we may not have a choice in what we do. Galino clutched his sword. Protecting the earth is our priority, Maven said. Maven, Tori took a breath, and with her mouth agape, she covered it. The twins will get all the protection they need here, he reassured his wife though he wasn't sure himself what the Gargans intended for Earth, and he wasn't going to hand over his sons to let Ava rot. The unfair gamble only provided three hours until the Gargans' next move, leaving little room to prepare for the onslaught. That's the end of chapter five. Thank you for listening, and if you visit our websites or anything, just make sure you add a review. Yeah, thank you so much, Maria. And definitely anyone who is wanting to post a review, feel, feel really welcome to do that. Websites, Goodreads, Amazon, all of that. Um, and thank you for that introduction, not only to the story, but really to these characters' voices. That was great. So thank, thank you, Maria. You. <laughs> I remember I was a former teacher. You have yeah, to make voices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So reading next today is Sofia Bacadano. Sofia is a Brazilian Spanish writer and filmmaker and is currently a film student in university in Brazil, where she holds a certificate from the New York Film Academy in Los Angeles. She's passionate about the importance of imagery and beauty in a scene, both on screen and on paper. She grew up between Brazil and Spain and currently lives in Sao Paulo, Brazil. This is her first novel. And in Sofia's debut novel, Sunny is a high school teacher in her late 20s navigating the hospitalization of her best friend, Charlie. As a narrator who feels like an observer in her own life, Sunny examines what her life without Charlie might have been like and what life with him has meant for her. The story moves through time non-linearly, exploring Charlie's family, his and Sunny's mutual friend, Louis, and Sunny's past and present. Sophia, the mic is yours. Um, hi everyone thank you everyone for being here thank you to the other two authors it's so amazing to see other people working with atmosphere and also thank you atmosphere for organizing this um i'll be reading from the first chapter so giving an introduction to the book and the characters and yeah i'll begin now <laughs> so chapter one he lay in a frigid whitewashed room that smelled of nothingness yet he could swear it smelled just like his childhood home like the orchard he kept saying that was the morning of his MRI. I tried time and time again to say he wouldn't die, but he shook and pulled on his bed sheets until his dotted eggshell colored hospital gown tore open with his frantic kicks. He wasn't embarrassed by it, and why would he be? Charlie's embarrassment was never one to show, 
like a bad friend home missed her birthday party four years in a row. Charlie did not get embarrassed. Charlie threw tantrums, and the world felt them for him. His nurses are twins, Jamie and Hayden. They're the kind of twins I couldn't have told were twins by perception alone. Sure, they're both short and dark-skinned, with eyes the color of almonds, but they're different sexes and have amazingly different facial structures. I like to observe these things, little details in people's faces, their expressions, the way they react to things. Charlie tells me it's something a psycho would do, all this observing, and I tell him he shouldn't say that, though I'm not sure why. I think I read it somewhere. I found out Jamie and Hayden were twins a couple of evenings before Charlie's MRI, the day he first arrived at the hospital. He fell asleep early that night, which is rare for him. Charlie's a night owl. I couldn't sleep at all, so I kept an eye on open and studied Charlie in deep slumber, his fist red as he held tight, tight, tighter to his pillow, his body tossing from one side to the other violently. Once, Charlie told me he couldn't remember his dreams, but that night I remembered for him. I sat on an uncomfortable blue plastic chair, rubbing my eye, when nurse, nurse Jamie burst into the room and asked if I needed anything. As it turned out, I needed conversation. So began this relationship I formed with Charlie's nurses. Each time he slept, I tried to imagine his nurses were mine instead, though all they did for me was talk and chat and blab and other synonyms, and bring me apple juice boxes, which they didn't have to, but did anyway. On one of those nights, I sat drinking apple juice and wondering what it would be like if I could pour apple juice directly into my brain and drown out my thoughts. When Nurse Jamie began talking to me about her mother, who was sickly because she felt so alone in old age, with all her friends dying, I said, maybe there should be a hospital for lonely people. Charlie's doctor was a beautiful woman called Dr. Gonzalez. She was tall and slim and carried an elegant aura around her. The way she spoke was poised, carefully measuring, measuring her words, balancing trying not to freak us out too much, but making sure we knew Charlie's condition was serious. I had begun to think Charlie's two lively nurses and his dull, beautiful doctor to be the kindest people I had ever met. It was their job to make Charlie not die, and no longer mine. I read it's like being buried alive, Charlie stammered once or twice or three times the morning of his dreaded MRI. Jamie and Hayden waited outside the door for me to grab him by the wrist and take him to the room where he would be buried alive. Charlie, it's not like that at all, I said. For the next 45 minutes, I paced up and down the white hall, listening to a multitude of phones ringing so loudly they became a giant fire alarm ringing in my ears. Nurses came, nurses went, sickly people rode by in wheelchairs. Someone's in surgery, someone else is out of it. Now I find Charlie in his room, Jamie lifting him up on the bed. I look at him and I don't think that's really Charlie, but he sure looks like him, face as still as his body and just as unkind. He glares at me. I ask, wasn't so bad at all, was it? I share a sympathetic smile with nurse Jamie as she closes the door. We're alone now, the two of us, Charlie and Sonny, a two-headed creature. So, I say, Nurse Hayden told me you were getting lunch soon. You must be hungry. You didn't even touch your breakfast. Charlie scoffs and turns his head on his low pillow to look at a dark medical poster on an, on an otherwise plain wall. It's a frightful poster of a human skeleton that looks more like a map for a scavenger hunt. Little red arrows point at stones in the body as if indicating treasure. I think about how nice it would be to see a treasure found in a hospital room for a change. I think about the first time Charlie performed the set on stage, as I watch his leg shaking up and down on his bed. It's sort of infuriating, but I feel bad about being infuriated because he's anxious and that would be insensitive. Also, he might just die soon, so he's probably nervous. Do you know, he says, voice rough like he's recovering from a cold, what happens if you've got metal in you and you go into an MRI machine? I don't know. I also have no interest in knowing, but I don't tell Charlie that, so he explains it to me. The MRI machine uses magnets to create strong magnetic fields. Think 1,000 times the strength of the souvenir magnets you've got on your fridge. Charlie pronounces souvenir in a weird French accent. Once the field turns off, the protons return to their usual orientation, which creates radio signals that the MRI machine can measure. It's honestly really cool. Charlie's really into research. He's also a comedian, so he doesn't do much of it. But in college, he used to spend long days in the library looking up all sorts of things. He'd call me at night and tell me facts about jellyfish and pandas and the French Revolution and Broadway musicals. Charlie keeps talking. He rarely ever stops once he gets started. He says, but it's that strong magnetic field that makes metal so dangerous because it will yank any metal toward it. That's why they tell you that you've got to remove all metal from your body before getting scanned. Any piece of metal can kill you. He turns on his back to study a small and significant crack in the ceiling. I study his face and I think he resembles a significant crack in the ceiling. In the big scheme of things, Charlie's nothing. He's one out of billions of people on the planet. But to me, he's a friend. To him, he's himself. 
And even though we both know he's a small, insignificant crack in the ceiling, neither of us want him to die. I notice how his eyebrows are thick and expressive in an almost cartoonish way. When surprised, he raises them to his forehead, and when upset or pensive, he lowers them to his eyelids. This is why he's always been such an incompetent liar, if you've known him long enough. You can tell how he feels simply by looking at his face. Now I know he's hungry, but won't admit it, because he wants me to feel bad for making him go into the MRI machine. The worst part is, whenever he wants me to feel bad, it works. Why do you Google this stuff? I ask. You're setting yourself up. Charlie breathes loudly. Because I should know. I didn't even tell you about the burns yet. That's the most common kind of MRI injury. If metals left inside a patient's body, or if they have, like, a tattoo with me metallic pigments, the magnetic fields can heat up the tissue around it and burn you. He raises his forearm so I can see it clearly. Right above his wrist, he has a small tattoo of the silhouette of an apple tree. I conclude, you spent 45 minutes in there thinking you were going to die. Bingo. He didn't die, though. I tell him that, and I ask if he's scared at all about the results. Dr. Gonzalez is supposed to talk to him about them tomorrow. I'm excited to see her. It's nice to observe the way she talks, even if it's bad news. Worst case scenario, I die, he says. Best case scenario, I die. I get annoyed at him, even though I don't want to. His doctor said I shouldn't get annoyed at him when he talked about these things. I should observe these comments for patterns or something. I say, you shouldn't say things like that. Why not? You upset your mother, that's why. I have papers to grade. Beside my plastic chair, there's a bag, a folder filled with high school US history papers peeking out, staring at me. Charlie sits up in bed. Can you read them to me? Makes me sleepy to hear you talk. I reach down to my bag. Swiftly, the folder nearly floats out and onto my lap. One hand opens it with difficulty. The other shields my eyes against blinding white light. Hospital lighting now appears each time I beat, I beat a dozing up. My eyelashes begin to flutter, and suddenly, an irrational, horrible thought flickers. If my eyes do close, they'll never open, and all I see is white light, and hear only a machine static for an incessant beep. In the low likelihood that I do drowsily curl open my chair and begin to dream, it quickly turns on me as an eerish, night nightmarish scene of flickering lights, Charlie missing from his bed, now covered in blood, my fists usually banging on, on the walls for no one to hear. Which is why I haven't been sleeping a lot. I wish my apple juice brain theory were true. I pick up a red pen from the bottom of my bag and get to grading papers. Okay, I say. I'll start with this one. It's a paper by Joshua. Charlie, are you listening? Charlie's eyes lock on mine. He's got small, round eyes like a doll. They're brownish, but turn yellow under sunlight, which I think is cool. Charlie doesn't think much of it or of anything about himself. His lips curl up. I'm listening. Keep going. What's the paper on? The Civil War. Which one? I'm a U.S. history teacher. I crinkle my nose. The American one, I say coldly. They're supposed to write an essay or whether or not they believe the Civil War was inevitable. A genuine laugh escapes Charlie's throat. Sounds boring. What's the right answer? Blindly, I reach into my bag as my glare stays stiff on Charlie's empty, renounced bedside table. Hospital rooms are by default sad, but some have flowers or balloons or stuffed animals or get well cards. Charlie's has only a duffel bag his mother brought over a few days ago with some clothes, a couple editions of Science Magazine, and a small musical keyboard he hasn't played yet. There are no right answers in essays, I reply. They're supposed to convince me their answer's right, and I'm supposed to grade them on how well they've managed to convince me. Doesn't matter what I think. I hold my glasses up to my eyes and watch Charlie become blurred behind the inkling lenses. You still haven't told me if you're going to have lunch or not, I say. Tap, 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 tap. Charlie passes his slender fingers on the headboard. It's not lunch. I can eat it. You're the last person I know sh should ever be in a hospital, I say. He rolls over to lie on his tummy. What can I tell you, Sonny? I was born a princess. That's the end of chapter one. So thank you everybody for listening. And if you're interested, please check out the link that I think is in the chat in the chat for purchasing the book. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. And definitely, yes, everybody check out those links in the chat because you can um, directly see the books that way and place your order. So um, and thank you, of course, Sophia, for that reading, too. That was wonderful. So our final reader for today is Michael Tavella. Michael was born in and grew up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. He spent his career of 44 years as pastor with his wife, N. Amanda Grimmer, at St. Andrew Lutheran Church in Hearst, Texas, and Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Abington, Pennsylvania. He was involved in the establishment of the North American Lutheran Church and served as Dean of the Atlantic Mission District of that church body. 
He's been among the adjunct faculty of the Reformed Episcopal Seminary in Bluebell, Pennsylvania, teaching New Testament, pastoral counsel, and Christian ethics. Presently, he's the executive director of Sarnelli House, a hospitality center for the people of Kensington, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's written a previous novel entitled The Light in the Ruins and now resides with his wife in the greater Philly area. Amanda and Michael have one son. Today, we'll be hearing Michael read from Adriel Peregrine. Adriel, the character whose Michael's novel shares, once embraced the teachings of Christ instilled in him during childhood. However, a series of tragic events, including the loss of friends and service in the Civil War, led him astray from his faith. Immersed in a life of debauchery marked by alcohol, prostitutes, and opium, Adriel became a wanderer in the desolate wilderness of the world. Now, Michael, you can go ahead and unmute on your computer and begin your reading. Thank you very much. Thank um, Michael, I think first you want to go ahead and click the unmute button on your Zoom screen. So if you're looking at the Zoom screen, it should be in the, I think it was the top right of your window that you'll see it. Actually, I think I can hear. I just sent a Zoom message. It might say the host is asking you to unmute. Okay, thank you. There Great. we go. <laughs> uh, we've had some difficulty setting this up for me, and I appreciate Hala's work in trying to fix things, and I appreciate Atmosphere Press for this opportunity to read the first chapter of my novel. Um, and I appreciate the readings of the other two authors. Thank you. The first thing I want to do before I start reading the first chapter is make a comment about the cover, which I thought was outstanding. And I thank Atmosphere Press and Ronaldo for all the good work they did. It's a picture of a young man facing the sun uh, in a field of poppies that, of course, are, uh, are grown to produce opium. Uh, he is wearing some of the items that he wore as a soldier in the Civil War. It really is very effectively a picture of a lot of what the novel has to say. And so I begin with a, a quote from a book that Adriel Peregrine wrote uh, during his lifetime called A Wanderer Who Becomes a Pilgrim. I would be a pilgrim to the Holy City. My family name, Peregrine, indicates that I am a palmer, a pilgrim to the Holy Land. Yet I have wandered restlessly through near and distant places with no goal or end. My soul is weary. I have been Adriel Vegas, wandering and inconstant. I wish again to be Adriel Peregrine. In a, in a secluded corner, of a rural central Pennsylvania church cemetery stands a grave marker close by several willow trees planted sometime after the interments with low hanging boughs that in a breeze tap against the top of the simple monument. The trees are symbolic of both grief and eternal life. The weeping willow is called thus because rain runs down its leaves as if it were weeping. In their distress, the people of Israel wept about their captivity under the willows of Babylon. All of us weep because of the suffering and loss we experience in this mortal life. The willow also represents hope, life, and the strength of God. The stone reads, Adriel Peregrine, and also bears the name of his beloved. A willow tree is carved on the stone. Stories of extraordinary people linger long after they have died. Tales of Adriel's life were no exception. Though little known by most people in his life and death, he was a hero in the little world in which he lived. His writings had a limited circulation, but those who read them did not come away disappointed. The oral tradition 
and family records have together carried faithfully over several generations the narrative of his life. His words and deeds reflect the conversion of life that turned him from the self-destructive tendencies all of us on some level exhibit. One habit in his youth was laden with the possibility of his total disintegration and ruin, an account of which one will find here. When young Adriel would wander through the hills, thundering Sky, his middle name was Skyler, laughing to himself about how clever he was. Though he did not shun the company of other boys his age, Caleb uh, Landis was a close friend of his, he enjoyed his solitude more. During his peregrinations, he would imagine himself a wanderer through lands exotic and strange where he encountered beings of the same character. Without evidence except for a vivid imagination, Adriel believed that humans shared the world with a host of outlandish folk who shielded themselves from exposure to human beings. At times, uh, in the rustling of a bush or the soughing of the wind through the trees, he believed he could hear these elusive denizens of the forest and fields fleeing his presence so they would not be exposed to his sight. Exposure was ha hazardous to them, for when in danger of being sighted by a human, they would evaporate into the air with no assurance that they would rematerialize, or so Adriel concluded in his fancy. Adriel was always on the lookout for evidence of their existence. He convinced himself that the objects of the world that we saw and touched were not all that existed. Many things escaped detection either because of our inattention or their elusiveness or both. The gentle breeze would take his own yearning into itself and in the local dialect of field and forest, speak for him to all the inhabitants of this fairyland. When alone, he would sometimes say, I am your friend, speak to me. He was convinced he heard them respond to the messenger breeze. Their voices were indistinct, but he would sometimes hear someone from that world call his name. At other times, he would hear indistinctly a chorus singing songs of love and joy. He was convinced that he had heard a song more than once that his mother had taught him. The elfin girl stood under an elfin tree, stirred by the wind to an elfin glee. Her true love took her by the hand to dance to the tunes of an elfin band. Such is the imagi imagination of many a child that with adulthood dies. Agatha, his mother, knew that Adriel was a dreamer, for he didn't hide his yearning in his questions and comments to her. Sometimes she would embrace him and place her cheek next to his, rock his head, and answer the best she could without disillusioning him. His father, a hardworking and practical man, was preoccupied with his duties on the estate. Many things not pertaining to his responsibilities escaped his notice. He felt a strong loyalty to Massey Alden, for whom he worked. Sylvan didn't want to disappoint his employer, who treated his family well. So Sylvan didn't have the imagination of his son, nor did he understand it. Though perplexed by Adriel's dreams and wanderings, Sylvan loved Adriel and gave him time and attention despite his many responsibilities. He wasn't demonstrative in his love, but expressed it. He would make Adriel wooden toys with his skilled hands, join his wife and son in walks in town fields, read stories to him, and join in prayers before bed. Teach. He would teach Adriel skills that would be helpful to him throughout his life. Sylvan expected much good to come from his only son and child. He could be demanding. Adriel dreamed the faraway places, both imaginary and real, but such dreaming didn't make him 
an inattentive student. Reading filled his imagination, and so he read voraciously. Among his favorite authors was the great Washington Irving, who died on the day of Adriel's 14th birthday. With the great writer, he traveled to Granada and walked through the Alhambra. He learned of Moorish Spain and Spanish conquest. He traveled the road on which Ichabod Crane fled the headless horseman and came upon Rip Van Winkle as he was sleeping his long sleep. He built in his thoughts, Knickerbocker, New York. Adriel wandered with Odysseus, campaigned with Caesar, Caesar, hid away with David from Saul, slept in the Mead Hall with Grendel's victims, overheard the open sesame with Ali Baba, traveled from hell to the gates of heaven with Dante, and beheld with the poet the beatific vision accompanied by Beatrice Portinari, then St. Bernard. Someday, he thought he would travel through exotic lands and write about them. Keeping a diary and writing poetry and short stories were preoccupations with him. Adriel asked Joshua Schreiber, who became the teacher of the one-room school where he, when he was 10, many questions about distant exotic places and people, often remaining after class to speak with him. Joshua was generous with his time on behalf of his students, especially Adriel, whom he regarded as conscientious and imaginative. Before settling down to wed, uh, Schreiber served in the United States Navy, his last assignment being on the stream, on the steam frigate USS Susquehanna with Commodore Matthew C. Perry during his two expeditions to Tokugawa, Japan, that the United States insisted on opening to the world. Aware of Adriel's great promise as a scholar and writer, Mr. Olin made it financially possible for the boy to attend a private boarding school from which he graduated. He had spent one year studying to be a teacher at the local normal school, also financed by Alden. He had returned home to attend a party thrown by the father of a young woman in the vicinity. It was during the last Christmas break that he fell in love with Abigail Dunlap, a classmate in the schoolhouse and a good friend from childhood. Abigail was a beautiful woman. She was as beautiful as a morning glory opening at the beginning of the day. Her black hair curled over her forehead and fell halfway down her back. Her eyes were a deep green, like the green of the ocean. Her face was a perfect symmetry, long, but not too long. Her skin was pale, but not so pale as to make her look like a black-haired ghost. She was of medium height. She walked with a certain non-affected elegance, improved and nurtured in the days she attended a private girls' boarding school not far away from her home. She graduated from the school in the spring of 1863. Abigail's father was a prosperous local farmer, owner of a grist mill and a general store, a stockholder in the very recently completed Columbia Reading Railroad that began operation a few months before to the nearby town of Mannheim and involved in various other commercial enterprises. He adored his only daughter, as did his wife, her mother, Catherine. The parents were protective of Abigail and noticed when she spoke of boys. Whenever he had an opportunity during vacations, Adriel stopped by the Dunlap farm to visit Abigail as she was concluding one of his long walks, as he was concluding one of his long walks. On the first day of his visit home, he had missed her, for she had gone into town with her mother to do some shopping. Conrad Craybill, a longtime trusted servant of the Dunlaps, met him at the door of the stone farmhouse that looked more like a mansion. Is Abigail home? In a formal and cold voice, Conrad answered, not at the moment. She won't be back for hours. He was lying. He was lying. Abigail and her mother were expected within the hour. He didn't invite Adriel in, nor did the, the servant encourage him to come back some other time. Abigail's father, 
Hamilton Dunlap was not warm to Adriel. He hoped that Abigail would not become interested in a young man who didn't have the social standing and prospects of his own family that he worked so many years to achieve. I think that's my 15 minutes. I'd like to read more of the first chapter, but that the time has run out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, and at this point, oh, one second here. All right, so at this point, um, we do have time for our audience Q&A. Um, I do want to remind everyone one more time to definitely check out those links in the chat. And thank you again to um, Michael for that reading as well. Um, but for our audience Q&A, if you do have a question for one or more of our authors, go ahead and type those in the chat and I'll make sure they get asked. Um, I did get a couple of questions in private messages, so we'll um, definitely get into those. For, so for this first question, this is a question for Sophia. Um, this person says, since you have a background in film, I'm curious if and how that affects your writing style for a book. Yeah, it affects a lot uh, of my writing style because I often read books as though I'm watching them as films. So every time I'm reading a book, I can always imagine like how it would look on a screen. And that definitely affects how I write as well, because I always try to write more visually. So I always describe places and, and people and what they're wearing and what they're doing, especially gestures. I always like to like, there's a scene in the book where uh, Sunny is with her friend Louis in a coffee shop. And I like to describe the way that he's like moving with the uh, with the um, with his cup where he's drinking like a beer. And I like to, to describe the way that the like the water droplets run down the cup. And I think that's kind of a, like a more cinematic thing than uh necessarily like literary thing. But I think it's very nice to like mix together those two worlds because I think they complement each other so well. Yeah, definitely creating that um, image, the, the image in the reader's mind, I think is um, such an important part of writing that perhaps some sometimes writers kind of neglect a little bit. So I, I, and I, especially, you know, you often hear when people are complimentary of that style, they literally call it a cinematic style of reading. So that totally makes sense how that goes. Um, yeah, so we have another question. This one's for Maria. This person says, I noticed this is the second book in a series. Was it easier or harder to write this book than the first book? Well, not necessarily because you pick up where you left off and you just keep going, which is what I tend to do. I just keep going and going and going. It's like come kind of almost like an obsession that you have to get through this and and see where the characters are taking you. They just keep talking to me. I feel like the characters are behind me whispering, do this to me, do this to me. <laughs> and I just keep going, trying to type as fast as I can. But each book has its special moments, but I feel like not one or the other takes longer or harder to do. It's just treating it as, as its own and just keep going. Yeah, I, I think um, it kind of depends how separately someone thinks of the different books in the series, but they really are so interconnected that really it's just that continuation, like you said. Um, I'm also curious if perhaps the reason this person noticed this is the two books behind you. I, I love this background image, Maria, so I just want to shout it out real quick. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wish it wasn't reversed. I don't know why it does that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've got another question. This one's specifically for Michael. Um, so go ahead and unmute when you're ready, Michael. But this question is, do you have a background or I? you said you have a background in Christian faith based on your author bio. Um, so how did you draw on that for your story and where did that start? Oh, Michael, you'll just want to go ahead and unmute on the Zoom meeting first. Okay, sorry about that. All good. Okay. Um, I I have almost in the first book, The Light in the Ruins, I had dreams and uh, uh, thoughts about the book 
that developed the plot and to a lesser extent for Adriel Peregrine. Um, it, it, the book comes out of my concerns for um, people being pilgrims. And it, it comes out of a, a sense of uh, the danger in the, in the 20th century of opium, which was a problem in the 19th century. In addition to that, he's a wanderer. So to have real events coincide with the issue of whether you're a vagrant uh, uh, or a wanderer, uh, I, I put him around the world. In fact, he circumnavigated it. Uh, where did I send him? I had an interest in Chinese history, so he was in Hong Kong for a while. Uh, Britain, uh, another place. He also worked along the Delaware Canal in Pennsylvania. And I used local uh, color from my own childhood for his hometown. So Adriel wanders. He, he works on a ship that brings opium from India to China. He finally gives that up and returns to the United States and then to Britain. He ends up in this terrible crisis. And I don't want to give too much away ends up in Britain and then Lindisfarne, which is an island off the British coast. So there was a circumnavigation that goes along with his name Peregrine, which means wanderer or pilgrim. Uh, and his first name, Adriel, means flock of God or God's flock. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I, th I think it's uh, the question is curious about your, um, oops, sorry, one second here. Sorry about that, Michael. Um, yes, the I think that does answer um, this person's curiosity about your um, background and how that impacted the book. So yeah, thanks for that kind of insight. Um, we've got one more question. This is for all three authors. Um, and this person wants to know, what has been your favorite thing about publishing this book? Um, Michael, do you want to start us off with this one? We can go in reverse order. Uh, would you say it again? My, my favorite thing for what? about publishing this book? About publishing the book? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Atmosphere Press for the great work they did. Um, there's a certain satisfaction in having written a book. Uh, I was I, actually feeling much more satisfied with this one than the first one. Um, I had a good uh, publishing experience with Atmosphere. And, um, you know, when an author writes a book, it expresses many of his, his or her own feelings and expressed a lot of mine from my own personal experience. Um, I also, being a pastor, uh, had a great concern for the spiritual aspects of life. And Adriel, who really lost his way with prostitution, drugs, and alcohol, uh, well, will he find his way back? We'll have to see. Yeah, definitely. So um, going in reverse order, like we said, Maria, what about you? What was your favorite thing about publishing this book? <clears throat> My favorite thing about publishing this second book was that I already come in knowing what to expect from Atmosphere Press. So it made it a lot smoother to get the book done. But uh, what I really enjoyed was the cover. I think Ronaldo always asks for what we want. I send him sketches, I send him pictures, I send him uh, summaries of things and he puts it all together and, and he, he does a great job with his team. And I feel this time around, I already knew how the cover was gonna go. I gave my thoughts and, I, and it was a lot of fun trying to put that together to match what the book is all about. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. And I always hear a lot of great things about the cover design process. So I'm happy to hear that as well. Um, and Sophia, closing us out on this one, what has been your favorite thing about publishing this book? Yeah, so uh, since this is my first book, I didn't know what to expect. 
but it has been amazing. I loved seeing like the group aspect of book public book publishing. Like I spoke to so many people uh, from the editorial meetings to the cover, which I also loved so much. I loved working with Ronaldo as well. Um, and I loved just seeing the book come to life, seeing the book that was once just in a document in my laptop becoming something that's physical that I can hold here. It's it's amazing. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear that once again. Yeah, I'm, I, so thank you so much for that. Um, and at this point, I just want to say to all three of you, again, thank you for being here with us and for sharing your books. Um, Maria, Sophia, and Michael, just being generous with your time and um, our group today. So um, I also want to remind everyone that I'm putting the links to all three books in the chat one more time. Um, so don't forget that you can order Wing Stroke, This Is My Worst Nightmare, Please Be Nice to Me, and Adriel Peregrine from the links in the chat. Um, and also to everyone here, please consider also checking out atmosphere.press.com. There you can browse our new and forthcoming releases, sign up for our email newsletter, or submit a book manuscript of your own. You can submit your work to books at atmosphere.press.com and just let us know that you attended today's event. So we'll look forward to hearing from you. But other than that, that's it for our event today. So have a great rest of your week, everyone. Thank you.